Um, Brian O'Meara, who I know we all know, but if somebody has to introduce him or else he would just start talking and she wouldn't know when they were actually supposed to start paying attention. Um, <laughs> what? So Brian comes to us um, most recently. Well, I'm not going to actually do it backwards. I'll do it forward. So Brian did his undergraduate work at Harvard University. And following being at Harvard University, he went to the University of California, Davis Go Aggies. Um, he's part of our little mafia of, of Davis people that are here. And um, he actually started out with a much more organizational bent than a lot of you probably are maybe familiar with. He actually started working with Phil Ward on ants. Um, and he was also working with Mike Sanderson, co-advised, because he was interested in doing comparative biology on ants. So he was very interested in ants, and he was interested in ways to do comparative biology. And early in his career, he started to become frustrated by the fact that there weren't really methods out there to do what he wanted to do in a comparative framework. So he started to migrate slowly and very kind of succinctly over to method development. And as a consequence, he's now you know, considered you know, one of the, at the top of the field globally um, when it comes to comparative methods and what to do with phylogenies. You know, whenever I'm at meetings, whenever I'm at very important meetings, because I'm very important, people always ask me, you know, how's Brian doing or whatever. I mean, they're very aware of what his, his work is about. And it's really pushed the field, I think, forward when it comes to um, these kind of methods. So when he finished up at Davis, he went and he did a postdoc for two years or three years. Oh, a year and a half. year and a half. <laughs> I was close. Um, at um, Nesson. And then he came here and started in our department in 2000-something, 2008. Um, and so today, he is going to be telling us about developing and applying tools for understanding important biological questions and phylogenies. And, but before I introduce him, I do want to point out like one other interesting thing about Brian. Those of you that ever ask Brian for help, be very cautious. Because you think that you have something kind of wrapped up, and you just want his opinion on one little part. And he will immediately say, well, I really I would really like it better if you had done some kind of a sensitivity analysis, or maybe a power analysis. And maybe you should spend six months simulating various outcomes to be sure that you're confident in what your inferences are. And I think that that kind of caution is one reason why he has been so successful and he's well respected, is that he doesn't just jump in with an idea and say, I'm done with that. He's very cautious. But at the same time, if you do ask him for help, be prepared with the fact that you're probably going to have three more months of work on a manuscript that you're ready to hit the button on that afternoon. But anyhow, <laughs> Brian, why don't you tell us about developing and applying tools to answer <coughs> outstanding biological questions using phylogenies. Thank you. So first of all, for my apologies for my voice, I'm trying to go for gravitas, I'm just sick. So, um, it's a privilege to be able to speak to you today. Um, I've been very, very happy here in Knoxville, and in the EV department here. Great colleagues, great opportunities, great resources. So just thank you. Okay. Um, so this is, my, this is my job talk title. Now it's part two. It learned it since then. <coughs> my, job, my job talk abstract, apparently. Um, so when we talk about what you need to get, what was required for tenure, we're talking about a three-legged stool. It has three legs. Teaching, service, and research, with research being the most important. Okay? And I'm going to talk to you briefly about the teaching and about the service, then spend a bit more time on the research. Okay. <coughs> so teaching. So I've taught speciation, macroevolution, core evolution, and Hoff. And that was just this week. I've okay, also taught <coughs> biodiversity and also seminar. So I've looked over in the past five and a half years. This shows you know, what I've taught each semester, each year, and how many semesters of each. Okay? So we do a lot of teaching. I'll talk a little bit about my teaching philosophy in a minute or two. Okay? But besides the teaching I do here on campus, I also do an extensive amount of teaching um, at workshops and such. So I both organize and just be an instructor at workshops in Sweden and Switzerland, um, various ones in, at Nimbus and Nessent. Okay? And so I teach a lot more students that way as well, students who you know, at the cutting edge of starting to need methods, you don't know how to use them properly, I can help them at that point. Yeah. <coughs> One thing I try to do in my teaching is have lots of assessments. Right? So here's you know, our core students coming in and leaving. Right? And so on various measures, they, they've learned a lot. Right? 
Uh, we're trying to innovate in the kitchen techniques, whether it's you know wearing a board on my head to show why I, how, how we know Irish elk are extinct. Because you would see that in nature, right? To so using balloons into a SIR models to create um, an iPhone app for looking at biodiversity, to posting lectures online using clickers. Right? So what I try to do is not use technology for technology's sake, but there's a way where I can help students learn better by using technology I do. My overall goal with teaching is to make students start to question and think and think like a biologist. Right? I'm teaching students about new methods. You know, so they know this was done by Fossil Science 85, more important is they have this idea that, oh, species are quite independent, I just want to correct for that. Right? That's what intuition I try to build in my students. <coughs> um, here's some example of feedback, right? So in Bio 130, open dialogue, right? So it was a big lecture class, you know, we talk you know one-on-one with the students in their class. Macro evolution, right? So it's found very open, lots of questions and inter interactions. It makes, makes students think. Even core, students who like core, okay? <laughs> um, some it's difficult, but not communicating clearly, okay? And so this just really shows what I'm going to get out of my teaching, right? That people understand why we're doing the things we're doing, not just you know, listen to chart. <coughs> I'm looking to have four students that come here. Um, one co advised and there's just in my lab. And they do amazing projects. So Sam's looking at cyclic phylogeny using next-gen methods, pioneering some of that work. Jen Bosco is looking at evolution of behavioral traits across many species. She already has a data set bigger than anyone else is in the field. Um, Katie Masana is working on looking at parasitic plants on a very large scale, large scale as well as developing new biogeographic methods. And Elena Schwery, who just started, is already working on methods to look at tree conflict. This work done with my guidance, but it's their work. Okay, so I'll be talking about their work in the rest, during the rest of the talk. But over the next months and years, we will even start seeing them present with their work more and more. Okay, it's very interesting stuff, but it's their stuff I help with, not my stuff. So I'm talking about my stuff today. <coughs> I've also been very fortunate to have to work with many postdocs that come here. So so far, it's been ten postdocs, including about one fifth of all Nimbus postdocs. <coughs> Many of which have gone on to tenure track jobs or a few kids other postdocs. Okay, so, and many of them remember me today as well. So, you know, so there's been a lot of great work with my colleagues since I've been here. Um, one thing that attracted me to this EB department is how interactive we are. Right? And so, when I was first applying, I made this a chart like this showing connections between people based on co authorship. Right? Since then, I've added this connection. Right? <laughs> So here's me, the spider in the middle of the with you know, co-authorship co shown in um, red, and then various grant proposals, um, serving one of those students' committees, and so forth. Right? So I've worked with many, many people in the department already, I look forward to working with more in the future. Okay? So the other work I'm going to present today is work I've done with people, it's other work that's still in progress that I'm not going to talk about much today. Okay? So that's teaching and people. Okay. This is really why, I mean, this is one of the reasons why this is such a good department for me, just these connections with people from ecology, evolution, theory, it's just been a very thorough place for me. <coughs> service. So we're waiting for service here. Um, so I do, a lot, I do service both at the national scale, also locally. Okay. So nationally, I'm a co-organizer for the evolution meetings, the evolution meetings in, in Raleigh uh, this, this summer. I was only really organized for that. Lightning, talk, lightning talks, at evolution, I organized those the past two years. I remember the final task of the leadership team. So we create hackathons, which is when a bunch of developers get together with other biologists and start coding up software to fix things. Okay, so most recently we had a hackathon to connect a $10 million um, Open Street of Light project with another $10 million um, project to have this using trees and try to kind of stitch those together. And so we help build tools for that. I'm a member of the Iowa Bio Leadership Committee, and I'm actually this year running this meeting, which is a satellite meeting to promote open science in biology. Um, I've been lucky to remember the Society of Systematic Biology's Council. There's no picture of that, but it looks sort of like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I you know, really love trees there. Right? People who publish systematic biology. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> I've been Darwin Day, Tennessee advisor. Which mostly means getting out of the way of the great students who actually do the running of it. Right, but I haven't messed it up in the past three years, that's good. <laughs> it's a very great outreach. 
Um, an applications editor for methods of ecology and evolution, a reviewer for science, NSF, SysBio, etc. Right? Um, I maintain the CRAM task view. So there are 33 people around the world who maintain, or organize, you know, what, what we do with our four economic condo metrics, what we do with our invasion areas. Right? So I do phylogenetics, it's my job. We've <coughs> got other, other committees and things within the department. Things advisory committee, grad admissions, undergrad affairs, and so forth. I also do broader outreach as well. Um, a lot of work has been on promoting women in science, trying to get rid of barriers for women in science. So my first year here, I helped co-organize a women in science seminar series with multiple partners that Haynes Morris group sponsored for us. Um, <coughs> I try to protect grad students. So last year, in the federal shutdown, NSF's website just went dark. The students who were preparing the proposals had no information. So I archived it, and this was highlighted by Science Careers a couple different times, with where a place where students would go to get help. Right? So it made students less stressed during this time period. Recently, I've been a joint uh, representative of the Joint Council trying to work on a new grant to have th the three major evolution societies, systematic biology, AMAT, and SSC, work together to promote women in science in their, in their fields. I'm also a co-organizer co of a symposium on evolution this year in Brazil on women in science and phylogenetics. Again, looking at both the women who are doing great science in their field and also people who are working to break down barriers and what's needed to break down barriers in their field. <coughs> also, outreach via social media and the web. If you Google for Google Akiki, wait, you go to my page, not Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's teaching and service, okay, which, are, which matter and are very important, but let's go on to research. Okay. We're going to have acknowledgments. Okay. So here's my car, okay. <laughs> a Tennessee picture. Right? <laughs> and we're going to get support to do the research I'm doing. So we've gotten about fair amount of money from NSF to help with this. Right? Two grants to the PI, one is a co-PI. Money from iPlant. I was sponsored a postdoc and a working group. Um, Nimbus has I've been a member of three Nimbus working groups. We also have had many good colleagues in the form of Nimbus um, postdocs. Second Lead of Life had support for a postdoc there to make a new interface. Um, Nessent have been two working groups there since I've been here. And also Google paid for some students to get training as Google Smart Code. Okay, so it's all been very, very helpful for getting this done. <coughs> so I plan the rest of the talk is to talk about sort of Brief highlights of stuff I've done since I've been here, and then go more in depth on three projects that are right now in play. Okay? That are either at the manuscript stage or the revision stage, something like that. So I'm probably best known for a continuous trait evolution. Right? So here's a paper that I wrote before I came here uh, that just looked at two rates of evolution, or multiple rates of Brownian motion and evolution. Uh, this is the study 249 times. And since then I've worked with collaborators like Jerry Bill Yu and Tony Schwang on expanding, expanding, expanding this model. Right, so now we can do models that have selection of various strengths across the tree. We're working on new approaches that allow you to change selection through time and so forth. Okay. Um, with Tony, who is a Nimbus postdoc, we've worked on methods to actually go beyond the tree metaphor. Right? So now we're describing trees in the origin of life. If we're actually thinking at first of using coral as a metaphor. And coral is interesting, this coral has these articulations and holes and caves and stuff, whereas trees are branching. <coughs> you have with trees. But of course, now life itself is more coral in the structure, right? We know that there's reticulations in life. But we have no methods to deal with it really. Now, we're now getting methods to start building these networks, but not, not really useful with them. So with Tony, we're making this method to look at variety of motion on trees uh, that are also all on networks, where you have hybrids. And you look for things like, you know, when you have a hybridization event, do I have a burst of rate of, of, of evolution at that point? Okay? <coughs> Well, there's other work in play looking at this sort of Orson Lundbeck process. And I work with Orson Lundbeck trends and many other things elaborating here. So this is very, still a very active area of research. I work with species limitation. So I have a bunch of organisms in nature, how I know if they're one species or five species. Right? So a paper that published this since I was here. Also, Karen Martin and I have a grant together. We're looking at speciation of fungi comparing old world and new world species, trying to find new, new diversity there. Um, hidden rates, right? So we're just looking at traits and looking at you know herbaceous versus woody, right? 
right? And think of those as everything that's woody is one state, everything that's herbaceous is another state. Well, that's not true, right? I could have herbaceous plants that have no genes for woodiness, right? They're stuck there. They can't get rid of woody again. Or other ones that have still the same genes, but just not be expressing them. They can just flip back to woody. And so most of our methods can't deal with that. They just assume Woody is Woody is Woody, right? And with Jerry Blue and Michael Donahue, we've made a method that allows you to have multiple types of woodiness, multiple types of herbaceousness, or other traits like that, right? And so we actually fit and find models fit a lot better, and you actually start estimating, oh yeah, that makes sense. Oaks never change from being Woody, but um, Asteraceae keep changing all over the place, right? Because of the different rates they have. Okay? I also wanted to work with Joe Williams on this, looking at <coughs> pollen cell number evolution. Okay. So it's something that's becoming more and more broadly useful. Um, like most of my work, this is available now as software, so that anyone can do it. Right? So we put the effort to you know, develop, develop these methods so we can answer questions, but also let other people go out and answer their own questions. Okay. Of course, it's all open so you can modify it. I've done a lot of work on empirical, empirical studies as well, um, whether it's looking at you know, callous evolution, or looking at how plants evolve to live in, in freezing areas, right? Looking at how lizards evolve in different islands. Okay? So often in these cases, I help with analyses, but also help develop new methods or new ways of looking at the data to analyze things. So looking at, you know, <coughs> how are we getting stuck in certain rates? Which, which state do we get into first? Um, how can we actually look at what rate evolution is happening? Okay, so I helped a lot with those papers. Scaling methods for large trees. Right? So when I was doing my empirical work, you know, I was in the Mojave Desert going, finding ants, you know, getting stung for my 35 species. Woo, 35 species. I, was, I overlapped as a postdoc with Stephen Smith. And for fun, we were making an insect tree. And so there's this tree of thousands of species. And there's that little tiny group of ants on the tree. Right? And that's what we're looking at now. We're looking at these giant trees. <coughs> and our software can't keep up. Okay? And so some parts I'm involved with to deal with that, one is iPlant Collaborative, where right? we make these tools that can scale for thousands of taxa and put them online for everyone to use. Okay? Another thing I've done is do dating for thousands, for thousands of tips on trees. Right? So Rights, the program written by Mike Sanderson, does a very good job at dating trees, but it can't, doesn't scale well to large numbers of taxa. Right? Path is a different program that scales well, does a pretty bad job. So what we did is take Mike Sanderson's algorithm and scale it up to work of thousands of taxa. Okay? I mean, this is in order to, we need to answer a question we're going to talk about later in the later section of the talk. <coughs> Very excited to doing work with Mike Gilchrist and a former NIMBUS postdoc, JJ Chai, on realistic substitution models. Right? So we know that amino acids is under selection. Right? Yet when we're actually looking at DNA evolution, we typically use you know, very simple nucleotide models G to C, T to A. Right? If we have codon models, we might have the same codon model for all sites in a, all sites in a sequence. Right? <coughs> and the rate of going from methionine to cysteine is the rate of going from cysteine to methionine, right? the same rate. But if cysteine is what you actually is under selection as the optimal state at that place, but they have a faster rate going into it than out of it. Right? You don't get that using the standard approaches. But what we've done is create a very simple method that goes from a, a, a mutation matrix to a selection matrix, to a substitution matrix, using real-world population index parameters. And from there, you can get these realistic matrices that allow you to fit very realistic models with only a few parameters. And when you actually run it, we find that you fit the data much, much better, and more of you can actually predict the data much, much better. It actually fits real life better, which allows us to help understand um, phylogeny much more, much more efficiently, and also understand how proteins evolve much, much better. You guys are finishing up, so we have a grant for that, and now we're finishing up a manuscript as well. We also worked a lot on large scale synthesis of the field, right? So, explaining what's this phylogenetic construction thing to ecologists, right? They need to know too, right? So, we'll a chapter on that. <coughs> or trying to show connections and showing how the same model we use for evolution of DNA, we use that same basic model for looking at biogeography and for looking at evolution of animal husbandry in humans. Right, the same model underneath, we just call different names. So I show those deep connections, help people to actually see how you can expand this. Right? Oh, we use a gamma here, why don't we use a gamma here too? And people start thinking of that, but they realize it's all the same thing underneath. And I've done much more too. So
So looking at reuse of trees, looking at how good is AIC actually as a measure of KL distance, um, making interfaces for other packages online, um, trying to correct people to show that genera aren't independent, you can't, you can't ignore the independence there. Okay, so various other projects too not shown here. That's what stuff I've already done. So you can go, and if you're tired and have trouble sleeping one night, you can go download it and read it all. Okay. <laughs> We're talking about general stuff that I'm still working on, okay, with colleagues. <coughs> so we're talking about three different projects here. One is floral evolution, okay? And this is stuff where uh, Stacy Smith and I are equal co-authors, and lead, lead authors on this, plus we have a whole working group um, working together to solve this. We've been working this for the last six, six years, I think. Okay. Another approach looking at was a postdoc here, who, someone who was a postdoc here, Bart Banbury, looking at trait evolution. And find ongoing work now with Nathan, Nathan Jackson and colleagues at Ohio State on phylogeographic models. Again, this isn't all I'm working on at the moment. I'm working on you know, pollen evolution stuff with Joe, um, looking, we're working with fungus work with Karen and Ron, and so forth, working with play evolution with, with Gordon. So lots of balls in the air, right? I'm going to highlight these for right now. If you want to have a question about those, let me know at the, at the end. All right, so first, floral evolution. Right, so go out in nature and look at stuff. Right, what do you see? <coughs> what do you see? Okay, here are the tree things have no flowers, right? The short things have flowers, right? What kind of flowers do they have? Well, that would have you know, really symmetric flowers, right? We have some groups that don't, like orchids, right? Why do we see that frequency in nature? Why, why, do we, why are we seeing this pattern, okay? If we were to rerun the paper of life, you know, following ideas from Gould, would we see the same pattern again? If we come back in 20 million years, will we see the same distribution or will it change? Okay? This is a very basic question to try to answer with evolutionary biology. And one of the architects of modern synthesis, um, Ledyard Stebbins, okay, um, tried to answer this okay, back in 51. So he looked up you know, these very, very basic traits of flowers that are commonly used in taxonomy. Taxonomy, see, that's useful? Yeah. Um, so in this case, he's looking at these traits and thought, he made this some sort of clumping here. Right? And so he made this sort of very hard diagram to, to parse. Right? But looking at basically combinations of traits and seeing how often we see this combination in nature. So this particular combination is in 12 families in nature. Okay. This particular combination is in 36 families. This is in zero. Okay. And so if this plot shows all the possible combinations, it seems pretty clumpy. Right. So why might why there be these clumps? Because <coughs> he thought that combinations of characters evolve through natural selection. He said, okay, this clump this is adaptive peak. That clump is adaptive peak. And the species evolved to get to these adaptive peaks. Which is a great hypothesis. But there's still some questions. Right? What's the mechanism for that? Is it natural selection? Is it differential diversification? Okay. Which traits matter most? Things like pedal presence might matter more than like ovule position. Because it's hard for, you know, to imagine how ovule position would be expre where you express the selection of nature as, as much as you know, petals or not petals. Also, those of you who have had core, you should be saying, wait, he didn't control for phylogeny. That's wrong. That's deeply wrong. Right? We didn't know that. We didn't know that now. Right? So is this actually non random There's control for that, too. <coughs> and so what we do is take these eight traits and simplify to list of six traits we can score easily. Which is not really meaningful. You know, corolla present or absent, peri and separate or fused, radio bilateral symmetry, and so forth. And then we can look at you know, all these possible combinations. Okay? And on these plots, purple represents the presumed ancestral state. Right? So based on fossil record and other evidence, we think the ancestral, the early, earliest native had. Right? And then we can look at frequency of nature. Okay? We find so these black bars show the actual frequencies we see. And this gray line shows if I sort of sample species at random under uniform distribution, what would I expect? In the sort, right? And you see it's a lot more skewed than nature in, in nature in respect to a random, random uniform process. <coughs> okay, so it looks like seven is right. Nature is pretty skewed. One other interesting observation is that we still have this presumed root state, you know, having having petals, having unfused perian, having radial symmetry, and so forth. It's actually still pretty common. 
And that could be because there hasn't been enough time to move away from that state, or it could be because it's, some, it's an optimal state as well. Okay. So let's investigate that. Um, so think about why you go from zero to one for some character. Well, it could be natural selection. You often think, oh yeah, natural selection, this is one's optimal, and this evolved that way. Right? But that's the only process. It's also drift and mutational bias. Right? What about how many ones we see in nature? Well, it's this sort of thing. But plus, it's also processes like extinction and speciation. Right? As things in state one speciate faster, there'll be more of them. If they go extinct more slowly, there'll be, few, there'll, there'll be, there'll be more of them. Right? So all these processes together can lead to the trait distribution we see. Okay? And for many of you, you'll recognize this as the basic BISI model. Right? Um, Madison et al., Fitzgerald et al., and so forth. So that's great for one character, one binary character. We're going to talk about six. We're going to talk about correlations between characters. Is it going to have petals and a few stamens? Is it going to have bilateral symmetry and then a few ovary? Let's <coughs> somehow extend this to multiple characters at once. Right? OK, well, we can do two characters. That's not so bad. Right? Um, something like this. Right? Are these all the factors we have to worry about? No. Right? Um, Let's not worry about you know, time and chance. And it could be that we have lots of ones and lots of state one one because you know, that's the optimal state that we can move there. Or it could be you know, that just got there quickly by chance and you really really that that wouldn't happen. You could test for that as well. Okay. Can also simplify you know, these you know, drift selection mutations to just be some interspecific popular process, right? Microevolution. Because okay, so you have microevolution, macroevolution, and randomness. Um, so we've now extended it to two characters. Great, eight transitions, four birth rates, four death rates. Seems feasible, right? So we're going to do three characters. And then we have 12, 8, and 8. Four, we have 64, 16, and 16. Getting a little crazy. And for six, <coughs> 30, 84 transition rates, 64 birth rates, 64 death rates. Okay? And if we care about combinations, we're going to somehow estimate something like this true model, this full model. Right? Those of you who know BISI know we're, we're crazy, in crazy town right now. Right? You know, four parameters are pushing it. Here we're creating hundreds of parameters. Right? So we care about the combinations, but can't estimate the full model. So we can have a solution for this. And the solution is focal areas. Okay? So imagine we cared about just three states. We cared about corolla present, bilateral symmetry, and a few stamens. Okay, then something like an orchid. Right? It has petals, has you know, a few stamens, and has bilateral symmetry. Right? We say, maybe, maybe something about being, being that form is what matters. Right? That particular combination is what matters. And so we can do is just take things and say, <coughs> look at them and say, okay, that, that combination matches, that combination matches, that combination matches, but not say this one. Okay? And then code it as a binary character, right? Blue if it don't match, right? If you do have that, <coughs> so you go from this, you know, character, you know, huge ball of character combinations to this one, where you have those red ones match, correspond to these, and then the blue ones are everything else. And I could pull on this structure and get this basically, right? And what I have there <coughs> is fewer parameters. I can loop them. I can group them. So I can say all the red ones have the same birth rate. Okay? Doesn't matter, doesn't matter what you have for carbon unfused or fused, all that matters for your birth rate is are you a special combination or not? Okay? That matters for death rate too. That may, and then it also can have a transition rate within this group, transition rate within this group, and transition rate between them. Okay? And so I've made it, I've gone from a very complex model with many combinations to a simpler model that can now be analyzed. Okay? Um, that goes for many such combinations. Okay, so I can look at you know, a single character, or maybe only color prism matters. Just look at that one combination, look at that one thing for everything else. I look at four characters, look at a pair of characters. This lets me look to see what matters. Is it one character acting alone, or is it two characters acting in combination? Four characters acting combination, and I can test all these different models and see which ones matter most. And so, <coughs> we 
so we did. So we showed at five different transition models and six certification models in three of the six focal areas, right? Whereas those didn't have enough data, right? So we created a total of over 19,000 models. Okay. Well, we're, we, we, UT, we have power for that. We throw up the cluster, we're going to run it for a while, no problem. In fact, with the AAC, and actually can wait for everything. Okay. And from that, we found out of these 19,000 models, 10. 10 may have landed on the AKK weight. All right, so all, all the support for, these, for you know, all this model space was on just this small set of models, right? That looked at things like, they had things that were like, by the symmetry be important, or by the symmetry plus Corolla plus statements, right? But things like overposition wasn't important, right? It doesn't matter which side of the bin the overposition is in, it doesn't affect the rates. <coughs> So we simplify this big, you know, 64 state combination ball down to the looking at just those those three states together, and find that so here color redder means faster diversification rate or faster transition rates, and so we see a very fast uh, diversification rate in when they have bilateral symmetry, um, few statements in curl present, right? But also have a fast rate leaving curl present to be curl absent. Okay, so I'm looking at this is how actually flowers are evolving. Okay, so from this, I'm trying to draw some conclusions, right? So bilateral symmetry is important, right? But so is having a few stamens, and so is having corolla, right? So we knew that you know zygomorphic flowers might be have had a faster rate than uh, actinomorphic flowers, right? But now we know that also what also matters is the other combinations. I was able to actually get at Stephen's question of do combinations matter? Yes, they do. <coughs> I always look at the precision of pollen placement, right? Think about a bee going through an orchid, you know, producing a pollen placket right in one place, right? So that, perhaps that helps speciation rate. Um, and also I found in our models that differential uh, diversification rates seem to matter more to explain the pattern than rates hopping between states. Okay, so are we done? We explained it all. Well, no, we haven't dealt with time and chance yet, right? And for most studies, we've stopped here. Right. This is cool, it's wonderful, you can go publish it, great. Right? But you're saying, what's going on? And then you know, being influenced by Gould, the part of it is, well, is this predictable when it happen again? That's my question. Right? <coughs> and we can look at you know, what we expect the equilibrium between those rates, and make everything pretty much to have that combination. Right? And we can see a lot of stuff that does have that combination, but lots of things that don't. Right? Why might that be? Maybe we're not equilibrium. Right? So in general, we always assume we're at equilibrium, flowers are 140 million years old or so, by that point they must be equilibrium. Let's just an assumption, let's actually test that. <coughs> you know, here red shows that magical combination that has a fast rate, gray shows where it could have been present, you know, based on the reconstruction, and black shows where it wasn't. Right? And you see it took a while for it to evolve. There's a long wait time. And so what we did was actually simulate evolution. Right? So let's simulate evolution of millions of species, perhaps, through time. So not something up to you know, 500 species to simulate, but simulate the entire angiosperm tree. Okay? And rerun that evolutionary history multiple, many, many times, right? in this case, 50 times, and get a distribution. Right? So we start off with <coughs> everything having the root frequency, the root, the root state. Um, and then here's where, are, here's where we are now. Right? And then we simulate up to the present. In this part right here, um, we don't look at the distribution at that point, or correct for it with the sampling variance. Okay, and also we can simulate into the future. Okay, so there's nothing natural about stopping at you know 136 million years from the origin of angiosperms. We can go, go to 10, 15 million, 20 million years, and that'll help us predict, tell, help us predict what's going to happen in the future. All right, and if we're at equilibrium, you know, if we and continue to equilibrium here, then we should stay stable through time. Right? And what we find instead is that you know, the root state keeps dropping through time. Whereas that combination keeps increasing, actually it's going to keep increasing through time. Right? As we come back in 10 million years, we see even more flowers that have um, few stamens, bilateral symmetry, and, and petals. Right? It also shows that you know, flowers have been around for a very long time, and even so, they're not equilibrium yet. So still changing. So this dark radiation is still radiating and changing through time. That's a very cool idea. 
And let's look at you know, when these current characters occurring through time. You know, so here's our assumed root state, right? Then we saw you know, this one state change from there, and then two state changes, and so forth. And then if we compare the fossil record, we find actually that our simulations pretty well match when we see we're seeing start seeing these fossils. Right? So the way of saying, oh, maybe it's working well. Okay? And then you can see again in that plot, what we see you know, now is in our simulations and in the future. Okay. <coughs> so in conclusion of that, we have the conclusions we already had, right? But you know, why are cars at this wonderful combination of the first time really quickly? Well, it takes a while to get there, right? So the rate of macroevolution is constrained by the rate of microevolution, right? It's the process of changing within a species from one from you know having petals to not having petals. The time it takes for that sort of change to happen can affect things on a macroevolutionary scale. Right? So there's this connection between ecology and evolutionary processes. Okay. <coughs> so relevance in general in terms of my work. So this is something where we have this important question, you know, macro versus micro, repeatability, non-equilibrium, right? And all these problems, right? So we can't get a large enough tree. Okay, we'll make a method for that. We can't sample things randomly. Okay, we'll make a method for that. We can't use multiple characters at once. Okay, we'll make a method for that. We can't simulate characters. Okay, we'll do that too, right? And so we use this to actually answer important questions, right? It's not methods for methods' sake. It's if we have a question, we just don't stop and go ahead until we can answer it. Okay? As I try to have all my people go after two. <coughs> so that's one project. Another project is almost done is part of the flexible trade evolution with Barb Bamberg. Right? And those of you who are used to looking at methods have realized that you know that's like a long time to come out. Right? So internet contrast, 85. You know, six years old. Yay, it's a great day about that. Um, then contrast-based rate estimation, right? looking at different rates of evolution. That came out seven years later. Right? Now having two rates, this is my big claim to fame, where I had a couple job here, you know, 14 years, right, to go from one rate to two rates. That's pretty slow. I mean, yes, this, this is brilliant, world stuff at work, but still, <laughs> that's a very long time to wait for. Right? And that's all we can do the same basic model. <coughs> right, so classic Brownian notion, right, so rate of change. Um, multiple rate running motion, multiple mean or single back, multiple everything model, something that you know, Jeremy and I came up with. Um, all this stuff, you know, use this basic equation. We just plug different things inside, right? Is mu all the same number or different numbers, right? Is this based on just time or something else? Right? But it's the same equation, the same thing, right? <coughs> we often describe this, what's very normal, sort of a drunkard's walk, right? So here, you know, Picture of street in Knoxville, right? It's more of a beverage of choice. So it's stumbling along, right? And at some point, it speciates. Maybe they don't get that. And now we have two drunkards stumbling along, right? How do we model that? Well, the way we model that is not having them on the same street, but now they're completely independent streets, right? They don't see each other again, right? Now they're having, you know, they don't interact at all. Does that make sense in nature? Well, no, stuff interacts. The other species is allopatric. Eventually things come back, come back together. You start capturing you know, displacements, a process that goes on, mimics the process that goes on. You know, these interactions matter in nature. That basic equation we're looking at here, sorry, this one doesn't deal with that. It won't happen at all. Okay? So let's fix that. Okay, because we know these parts are important, let's model them properly. So things like dominant evolution are hard to deal with. Character displacement is hard to deal with. Mimicry. How is some external factor changing? You know, as climate gets warmer and colder, what happens? It's hard to model that properly. How to have mixture processes? I can do this or that, right? Chosen at random. It's hard to put that into an equation. So our goal for this project work was to allow empiricists to build and use your own models, right? You don't have to wait 21 years to come up with two rates, right? You can just make your own model and run it to answer your question. Because once I'm a tenure, I don't care. I don't really care. Um, <laughs> so our approach here is to approximate Bayesian computation. Right? And so one thing you do is you can discrete time. Because right? continuous time, that's scary for some of us. Right? But this, you know, is what you learn from the core. This is simple. You know, normal number, you know, normal, normal number. It's not hard to do. Right? And so <coughs> we can divide time into these discrete time steps. Right? So okay, each time step, you 
Draw a new, new number from the old distribution. Keep going. Right? And that's basically the free time equivalent of this variety motion process. Okay? What happens when you, um, how do you have things change? Well, <coughs> your next state is your current state, right? Plus some change that happens based on what you are, perhaps based a change based on what other things are doing. Right? So you can say, you know, you have some model that has just factors affecting you, right? So maybe I'm, I'm drunkard walking along. You know, how fast do I wiggle my parameters? Versus, you know, am I now being repelled? You know, they're going to say, oh, no, Nicole, come hit me. I'm going to run away from Nicole. Right? So it can have interaction between species as well. And so, you know, can put this as base, very basic R functions, right? You have a function, model parameters, run it. Extrinsic, model parameters, run it. <coughs> um, now, for our presentation computation, you have to be able to summarize the likelihood, right? So if I'm going to do this, you know, in the coin flipping world, where right, I have a binomial, I found the flip heads, okay? I could look at the actual string or portion of heads, result of the last flip, the way it's summarizing my data, right? And I could find that if I use the actual string or portion of heads and simulate many times, I could figure out um, <coughs> If I simulate and find my observed counts, matches my simulate exactly, it counts as a match. Right? So when I try to simulate to estimate something, I can spend many times and see how often I find it, and that gives me my likelihood. Right? But for a continuous thing, like say head size, right? well, I'm never going to have exactly the right head size. Right? So it's never going to match exactly. So for that, I need to have an epsilon from the kind of So if, if I'm within some, some region, is close enough as it's a match. Okay? Um, so for approximation computation, you need to have some way of you know, simulating, figuring out how to, how to test for a match, and what factors you use to test for a match. Okay? <coughs> and perhaps there might not be any one good statistic that we have for this. Okay, so here's our people again. I'm going to just abstract a little bit, right, on the tree. So on a tree, how can I say, you know, if I simulate again on this tree, how can I say that it's, it's close enough that it counts as a match? Right? Um, and so what we do in our approach is use multiple summary stats. Okay? And so, for example, the root state. Right? So if I simulate different root state values, and then look at the mean of my tips, right? I find if my, you know, if my true value is here, and the mean of my tips is these, these numbers here on this axis, you know, if I use simulate from 50, I find out that I'm very far from what I expected, right? But if I simulate at 10, ah, it matches. Right? That's a good summary statistic for that, for that parameter. And so looking at root state alone, there's something like the mean, or the max, or the min, the median, okay? Looking at what tax on two has in the state, all of those are good ways of estimating that root state, right? But for rate, it's different. For rate, something like, you know, the likelihood of a Brownian motion model, or, um, AIC for a white noise model, something like that can match, have a match model. Okay? So what we do is we can allow it to adapt and we pick which summary steps we have. If we want to have, if any user can develop her or his own model, you let the program decide which summary steps are most, most important. And as we have this, we're going to use Bayes' rule, we're doing a Bayesian approach here. Right? So probably the parameter given the data, probably the data given the parameter, so the probably the parameter, that would be some normalized integer. For this, we're using a coin flipping example, the table P4 prior, right? Um, we use a rejection approach, right? Which in ABC world, we sample parameters from distribution, we simulate data using those parameters, we summarize that, and the summary is close enough, we count it as a match. Okay? And then we just summarize these at the end that match. Okay? So for example, I have some parameter value here, I try simulating their different values, and look at the difference between the results from that simulation and the actual data. And if it's close enough, I say, okay, it's good enough. So I say here, in this parameter, all those points here could be, could be good values for my posterior. Okay? Whereas the true parameter over here, a different distribution. Okay, so how does this work in practice? <coughs> so for root state, I use this prior here, I get this posterior in red, and my true value is blue. So using this approach from general variant motion, we get it right. 
But the rank does it pretty well. Right? Now, this is a case where we actually know what the model is. It's very easy to use. Right? We don't have to use this ABC thing for it. But for your model, you might not have, have a good model. You might not have a nice variant motion model because it has something else. Right? So, for example, character displacement, um, <coughs> look at the case of anolis. Right? We think that anolis are definitely interacting with each other. Right? And looking at the rate which they're repelling each other, have a basic model where you know, I'm repelled by, by similar species who move away from me. Right? How strong is that repulsion value? And I can, you know, because I know everything can simulate, we find that my true value and estimated value of that model are very similar. Okay? That's the model we can't do now. That's the model we can't do outside of this world because we can't, all our, all our other approaches assume independence. Right? I've program to here and now I can actually analyze it. And so the those data set, <coughs> we get something like this where if we see that again with, that, with those primitive values, we see and those are repulsing each other. Right? So they sometimes get close, and they even cross. Right? But in general, this is the way those evolve, they have this repulsion. Okay? Um, <coughs> there's a great paper by Will and Hodges a few years ago looking at flower evolution. Right? And they had this idea that you have you know, some flowers that are small and are pollinated by bumblebees, and then you jump up on hummingbirds and jump up again on hawks. And this is their basic model. And so we want to test this basic idea, and they first look for different OU peaks, right? Using some methods that you know we developed here, other people developed. Um, and the best 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 fitting model had three peaks, right? So hawk moth peak, a moth, a bee peak, and a bird peak. And that's what test was evolution punctuated. You have these discrete jumps, and they said, okay, this is a model where we have changed all the speciation events, and they ran that and found, yep, it fit better. Okay, that's not really their model. Their model was one of you know, discrete jumps and then some changes, right? They try to approximate with an OU approach, that's not really their model, right? And so what we can do instead is code that entire model as this. This is it, right? And so <coughs> I have, you know, one process here, right? Where each step, take a tiny step, right? Each little time interval, change your, change your state a little bit. Here. Um, it's a pollinator shift, take a bigger step. Right? So rarely take a shift, take a big leap. Right? And then you know, switch between these processes at a different rate at a different rate. Okay, that's it. So the entire model of you know small changes and big change of pollinators is encoded as this one function. Okay? Which you know is a little special you could you could write yourself. Right? But it's a model that no one had done before this. Right? <coughs> and we so use this model, use some priors. Um, yep. <laughs> <laughs> just open source software, it'd be fine. <laughs> yeah, think about having the 196 slides. Just okay, so we found, you know, we estimated, here's our, uh, here's our prior for, for rate of evolution, and here's our posterior, a lot tighter. And here's what we found with the pollinator shift. So we found <coughs> under their biological model, they thought you always increase in size. Right? Under the models they could actually run, they could increase or decrease. Right? With our model, you can do either. You, you, can, you can pick either, you pick a bias. And it found a bias towards increasing. Okay? And actually, it has a biologically meaningful parameter um, where we expected a shift by log one millimeters, and we see the shift about log one millimeters. So you know, the differences between areas. Right, so we see, you know, our ABC estimate, so that is what we would sort of guess that from just looking at real distribution, right? <coughs> but you know, by, by, by making a you know a model just for that just for that kind of data set. And this could make it a little bit more. Um, so this general approach has advantages and disadvantages, which you know is Bayesian, which is you know, an advantage and disadvantage in my book. Right? Um, <laughs> It's flexible, but it can be really slow. Um, you could create a very stupid model and just let you run forever, not be able to estimate things. I have to be somewhat, somewhat careful. Um, it gets faster, and it has you know it's new things that have some other errors too. So this is one of the reasons why I'm you know I'm very careful. So we keep you know, checking to make sure it's working right. Okay, finally one more thing. <coughs> Algeographic models, right? So I come to a new land, right? 
I'm trying to figure out how, what's the geography in this area. Right? Um, you can tell me what reading, reading the letter. All right, so imagine I have you know these these specimens. Want to say okay, what's the history here? You know, was Fanghorn you know once connected to Merkwood and then, and then split, or were they all you know, or have they always been separate? You know, that sort of question. <coughs> and so you don't have any information going in, right? Um, maybe the mountains are a barrier here. Maybe I mean, that's something worth worth thinking about, right? Um, Maybe have really, maybe rivers are boundary and so forth. So what we can do is we can sort of lump these things into areas, right? And start thinking about how they can be related to geographically. Okay. And so we could have you know, something like this: this topology relating these areas, right? Or it could be this topology, or this topology. We could have different population sizes. We could have migration, right? We might have an entirely you know model where there's no actually causes in the population. It's just and basically only entirely with migration, right? Or a fully migrant model, right? And there's many, many, many phylogeographic models. The current state of the field is you create two or three and you test them. Well, that's great. But you don't know the history of work with and things like that, right? <coughs> um, how do you go and actually look at multiple models? And so we had this before in phylogenetics where people would you know, try to use a certain model of nucleotide, nucleotide substitution, and they would specify, ah, it's going to be this model, it's going to be this model. And they'll look up the program, it's had 13,000 citations, right? Where they look at all possible models and say, okay, this is your model, go ahead, right? And so <coughs> we developed this approach where rather than looking at just a few selected hypotheses, we look up many, many possible models, okay? And we're running out of time, so let me just breeze through it. Basically, our input is gene topologies and assignments, and then it creates a huge set of models. Right? So we create all these models. Right? Um, we can filter them if you want. So you want to say no more than two migration rates. We can analyze them and then find the best model or models. And then you can go and analyze them more thoroughly. Right? The advantage of this or traditional phylogeographic approaches <coughs> is that you don't have to come in and say, I think it must be a migration approach. You can actually let the data tell you the migration is important in your situation. Okay. Let me see if we had a couple of slides for this. Okay. So we tested this. So we, you know, many, many computer programs later. We tested this <coughs> using a variety of true models. Right? For each of those true models, we simulate gene trees, we simulate DNA, we infer gene trees, and we run our program. Right? So this makes it all much harder, right? So rather than taking your known gene trees, we actually simulate data on those gene trees, then to reconstruct them and get them wrong. Okay. So we have these gene trees that are on average right, but often are pretty wrong. Can our model work? <coughs> so running it, we found, you know, we have this isolation only model. You know, if you have deep enough divergences, it does really, really well at finding the right model. So a black bar means you found exactly the right model. A gray bar means you found the right kind of model, so migration only model, and we have all the arrows pointing the wrong way. Okay? And so for even very complex things like this one, we have some population coalescence and migration, our, our program is working very well figuring this out. How do we do this in reality? So in reality, people who are doing the geography are using you know, an isolation only model, or maybe an isolation migration model, we find that actually when you can compare all these models, they should actually be my models that have lots of migration. Right? So somewhere over here is that. Right? So looking at 19 different data sets, we can say, okay, if you were doing model selection correctly, you'd be inferring a lot of, a lot of, a lot of migration processes in nature. Right? Rather than saying, okay, I think there's no migration to these populations subdivided. Right? So we'll understand how, we're, you know, how to analyze our data better. Right? So summary for this part is we create many models, evaluate many models, um, it's prior free, so the earlier part of ABC is where you have no, no, no prior. Um, it should scale well. So we're working on, for example, a SNP method that can scale with thousands of different, gene, of different sequences. Okay. So conclusion for the talk. So what I've done here since I started was address questions about how species move through landscapes, what limits rates of evolution, how predictable is evolution, competition between organisms, and many more questions. That's very question driven. I answer those questions by creating and applying new models and new methods. 
So methods to deal with rate heterogeneity, more possible ways of dealing with continuous characters, simulating millions of species, examining correlations, and much, much more. In my teaching, I've taught hundreds of students to think critically and understand science as a process. Right? So they can understand why we're doing this and what sort of instances they should have. I graduated four students in 10 postdocs. I put in 20 grant proposals and gotten some fair bit of funding. Right? So thank you, SF, for your mistakes. <coughs> and the various service in the representation of women in science, Darwin Day, workshops, hackathons, conferences, and so forth. So I've really enjoyed being in Tennessee, I've really enjoyed my work here, and I hope to continue it in the future. So, thank you. So, question, I brought whiteboard markers too. So. models in general, you know, the right kind of model, the migration only, no population collapse, right? So which one does the, does that block of points correspond to? Is right. So these are migration only, right? Is right. It B or so the models are chosen from that were these, uh, and these, and these, uh -huh. right? So you mix the weight for these. Right. <coughs> so it might mistakenly infer. You know that there was one collapse. The only for us that there's still lots of migration. Other questions? So I was thinking about the uh, normal process you talked about earlier, where you have these loss and gains of trades. Huh? Um, it seems that the ability to regain a trade is going to be really dependent on how long you've been going without it. Mm -hmm. is there, um, have you thought about it? Do you think that that's an important thing missing from the model, or are you kind of satisfied at this point that the model does well enough and adding that is just going to increase your complexity? Right, so including that would make it like a non Markovian process, right? Where, well, you could have hidden states, right? Right, so that's where it was, right. So the way our current approach could deal with that is by having an intermediate hidden state, where, you know, if you've switched, you always, you always go from, yay, <laughs> zero to one to two, right? And the rate here is set such that you wait an average one million years to get to this one. And then um, at this point, you can go from you know, zero to you know, Woody or something, right? Um, and it could go back at some rate at this point and never go back that way, right? And so you can imagine some sort of rate here that leads you to this state, and then some rate that leads you to this fixed state. And so the model could pick up that, that way. So do you think that that's an important component that, that is worth is worth thinking about, or do you think that the model is done well enough at, at, at this point? I think it's, in, the, in the studies we looked at, it looks like it's working well enough. One thing we did that people that I really liked was looking at model adequacy. So we see, if you look at stuff in nature, it's often clumped, right? We have you know, a big clade of all of one kind, and a small little clade of stuff that's around, right? And you don't get that in a traditional model, but we found if we ran our, you know, estimated our parameters, we simulated under, our under that model, we found clumpiness that matched that clumpiness. So it seems to be fitting the model adequacy basis. So it seems to be fitting that well. Um, but actually, the next step forward for this is probably to add it to diversification models. Because we know that you know, if this has come to a different speciation rate than this does, that can dramatically affect your estimates of the rates if you don't correct for that. So all like busy world. So there's a busy world by adding hidden, hidden states to it. Other questions? Yeah. Thanks for uh, such a forward-looking talk. I mean, this is what you talked about. It's really edgy stuff. And, you know, <coughs> and it seems like what really gets you fired up is, is 
the next question. It's the next big problem. And so what do you think that is? And, and just oh, so what is the next big problem? Then? The next big problem is defending comparative methods. So there been a, there's a paper that just came out by Madison and Fitzgerald, which is a good paper, showing that like, sort of the Pagel classic approach we use looking at two binary traits co-evolving. Right? Um, that everyone's used, it has hundreds of citations, it's a cool, cool but very simple model, um, can be wrong. And it can be wrong in cases where if you have one of the characters changing just once, for example, the model doesn't see that as an issue. Right? It, it runs normally because it's a nice p-value. Um, and our approaches don't deal with that. So getting possibly spurious results. So another paper in review right now um, that's been going on in the community that shows us for other kinds of approaches too. And I think these are, these are real and valid concerns. Um, and what's the just saying, eh, that's awful, right? Um, why don't we just go out go and fix that, right? So I think through the notion of parameter who's trapping, for example, we can actually go after this and try to solve that problem. And so that's where I'd like to go next for that. In general, the other sort of area of growth is heterogeneity and life. Right? So you're looking at mammal evolution. Whales evolve very, very differently than shrews. Right? And we're now developing models like the OU models and the heterogeneity models that can deal with that. We're just starting to do that sort of thing. So I'm going to extend that to you. Yeah, Gordon. Now, I was intrigued with your distinction between the extrinsic and intrinsic. Mm -hmm. right. And that really is a question of how do you bring in uh, the plasticity and the environment Right. So you could put plasticity in as, you know, in those functions, there's a, there's a, there's a parameter for external information. Right? It could be like O2 level or something like that. And so if you imagine if it's just a plastic response such that, you know, I'm this body size, but if I'm in this condition, my body size is now 10 times bigger. Right? You could put them into the model such that you could have your base body size evolving under a Brownian-ish process. But then when they change to you know, a different regime, all of a sudden, just through the processing alone, what you see, what you should see is over here now. And so you put it in that way, and then into the model. Um, we haven't explored that, explored that yet. But actually, it's something you should pay attention to Jen Bosco's work. She's been looking at evolution of plasticity in general, we have correlation of plasticity. Um, for there, we're developing some new methods as well, so I hope to get some more work there. Other questions? Yeah. So how do you, like, when you're asking the parameters to think about switching between traits, and we're able to build methods to deal with articulation mm -hmm. on hybrids, I mean, first of all, like, how easy or how difficult is that going to be to do? And it's, and it's really going to be most evident in recently diversifying groups because, you know, because extinction happens, you know, once you get to a certain, you know, age, it's going to be very difficult to pick up hybridization because one of the outcomes of white time stint and then you kind of agree with by the getting model. Do you have any idea of how sensitive parameter estimates are going back and forth are if you did have that past in progression or yeah. hybridization and extension? With the here of the slide. <coughs> um, so for this sort of approach here, I mean, here's our here's the tree we have of actually cichlids. And so we have a case where we have you know speciation event, a lineage existing for a while hybridizing with this one over here, from the descendant lineage, and then going extinct. Right? And so right now we're sitting in a world where we know everything, and so we can put that on our tree. Um, if you don't have that, one thing we're looking at way to deal with that is basically rather than having hybridization has to occur with whole co-evil things, right? I can't hybridize on the end of all too, right now it's too late. Right? But my lineage could have been the past. And so you can make it so that the hybridization events are not co-evil. And so you have missing, missing, instead of having, you know, this and this wait period and extinction, you have it as a diagonal line connecting. And so this is not a parameter to the model, we should still be able to make it work. Um, one thing we haven't looked at yet is the discrete, how to hybridize with discrete traits, right? Because when we continuous trait, you say, okay, you're the average of your parents or a weight of the average of your parents. If your parent is state zero or state one, how does that relation work? I mean, all that matters is that you have to one parent. Right? And so maybe you'll care about that. I might have a trade coalition. Other questions? This side of the room. <laughs> gave me no cards. Come on. <laughs> Your, uh, the, the early evolution stuff um, is 
Like, 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 quibble in terms of, you know, like, the emotion on the slide, or, or, I mean, what do you, sorry, I don't know the context. No, 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 oh, no, 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 you just your big pumps and little pumps. Um, um, uh, yeah, no, I haven't, I mean, I haven't done with much of my crumbs yet for this. Uh, what, what, what's the question that you get at? What's, 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 what's what trade you're looking at? Well, so you look at, the big pumps are you Okay. Yeah, so I mean, you could model a process where you have competition between them. So, yeah, they all use the same substrate, but then these are traversing slightly faster. Um, will that lead to the sort of clumpiness we see in the trade? Yeah. yeah, so that'd be cool. They do it. Um, maybe I'll do it already, though, with like trade evolution models of daily diversification. Um, as long as it doesn't require interaction. Um, but if you have interaction, then it's going to be new. Other questions? All right, thank okay. you. Okay, yeah, let's say Brian and you will be <coughs>